Luke Richmond's a really, really cool dude. And he actually taught me one of the phrases that I now live my life by, which is thank you for allowing me to suffer. When anything gets hard, I just utter those words to myself over and over and over again. And it starts to become really, really easy. And if you watch the interview, you'll see where that comes into being. He's a really, really smart guy. He's an adventurer. He's traveled over the world. He's written books. He's just a really, really awesome dude. If you're someone who wants to be able to push through more pain, push through more adversity and wants to dominate every single aspect of their life, you should definitely watch this because you'll be able to pick up a heat from Luke just as I did. There we go. Heck fucking wizard over here. How about that? Look at you get fucked. I love that photos you've got behind you, man, of all the cool yeah, shit you've man. done. That's Good dope. Up. Got to put the adventures up there, bro. A hundred percent. I've been looking at this wall and I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to put there. But yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit bland when it's just white. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, bro. Have you noticed on the, in the media these days, all the talking heads that they refer to have books behind them to give that uh, overtone of intellectual ability? It's yeah, so because when they speak, it doesn't sound smart. No, no. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> But look at all my books they probably haven't read. <laughs> yeah, I haven't read. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Man, so many people do that. You know that you can buy fake books. Like, Come on. No shit. You can buy like a bookcase of fake books to put there. Oh, mate. The world's fucking doomed. Doomed. Yeah. Yeah, they are, man. I did say the way that it's going. I was actually having a really interesting chat with a mate of mine yesterday, his name's Johan. And he was like, he's in the tech game. And so they've done a lot of stuff with the tech guys. And he's like, it's fucked. Like if we let this crap continue to happen, it's just going to get worse and worse. And I read the- In, Codling- in regards to what? Like what's he referring to? So he's mostly talking about um, the way that we're going, we're heading towards, are you familiar with the Bronze Age at all? Like what happened there? No. Pretty much like long story short, lots of people died, right? And we had a massive regression towards the end of the bond, the uh, to the end of the Bronze Age. There were people that were conquering everything, and when people conquer everything, it doesn't, you know, turn out so well for the people who've been conquered. And then, ironically, the people who do the conquering don't end up terribly well off. Yeah, yep. Spread your means too far. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, look at Alexander the Great. He conquered the whole known world, and then he died with nothing. Unreal. Hey, British Empire, mate. You know, Romans, it's just time and time again, isn't it? Maybe yeah. maybe capitalism's the next one. Who knows? Yeah, totally. I think that, I, I don't have an issue with capitalism, but I th- have the issue with the way that people, like broken men, are looking to control everything and they're like continually trying to fill that gaping fucking void that they've got inside them with material possessions and success. Thank you, my love. And, and all that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, spot on, bro. Spot on. Mm. But dude, I know I didn't introduce you, but we've just been spitting some stuff, which I think is relatively interesting for the last couple of minutes. You call if we just continue anyway? Oh, 100%, mate. Just go. Let's do it. <laughs> so so what drives you, mate? Like you've done some crazy shit. Like what drives you? Oh, mate, um, the reality that I know life is finite, bro. And when I was serving in the military, I started to learn about, you know, life and death in those sort of, you know, trigger pulling ways. But it wasn't until I started doing big adventures and saw, you know, climbers dying that I realized, oh, mate, this thing, well, we're just animals. We're going to die at any time, you know, and if we're dealing with nature, it can be, you know, tomorrow. You just can't plan for it. So then I started living my life that way. So I only plan five years ahead, man, and usually it's all full of big adventures. What do I want to do between now and my death? And I'll write that shit down, whether it's go row an ocean, climb, this, that, all these, you know, real meaningful things that I want to do, and that's what I go out and do. Because so, so you literally plan to die in five years as if you're going to die within the next five years. I plan my life that way with that mental gymnastics of convincing myself, oi, man, it's all over in five years. What do you want to do between now and then? Like seriously. And then just honestly answer that and write it down. And whatever comes out, it doesn't mean you've got to give up on your life and, and run away and live in the bush or whatever. You know, you just got to start splicing that meaningful stuff into your current existence. Because we just get distracted so much now, start planning 30, 40 years ahead. Well, guess what, mate? You're not going to make it. You know, you will not get there. So live in the now, but make it meaningful. 
So most people are, are super afraid of like I was really afraid of death until I did way too many mushrooms or not enough mushrooms, one of the two, right? <laughs> And and it's it's really common for us to fear it. I mean, you look at COVID, right? We're probably going to get censored now for talking about it, but fuck it. Like, you look at that. Like, everyone's so afraid of a virus which has like ninety nine point nine 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 whatever it is percent chance of survival because we're so afraid of death. How did you conquer that? Not conquer, or how did you become okay with death? And like, all right, in five years, I'm going to die, and that's cool. Mate, it, it did help because you were face to face with it. So in the army. You know, you're dealing with some dead bad guys, but you have no no connection to those guys because you're there to do a job and you're very dehumanised in that role. So that didn't really affect me too much until years later, but it was the reality of seeing climbers frozen dead on the side of the trail. Well, that made it real. And the problem that we have in, in a Western world as opposed to a lot of other developing nations is you never go face-to-face with death. We don't wash the bodies you know, we don't often, you know, burn them and, and see that charred remains, like see the whole life-death cycle in reality and realise that we are just a bag of meat and bones like every other animal and something's going to eat us. We're all going to become a different form of matter. So in essence, it doesn't matter. Like just be be okay with that, be real with that and live accordingly. Don't get distracted thinking we're immortal because we're certainly not. So when you said that you, you're in the army and then it was only a couple of years later that you came to terms with death, like what were you meaning by, by that? Like you saw a lot of do- dead bodies and, and stuff like that, dead bad guys. Like how did that impact you? Well, mate, it's, I, I had that, uh, you know, cliche rock bottom moment, I guess. You know, I got out of the army and you were, you were transformed into this bit of an extreme character. You're designed to do a role, so you're rewarded for aggression, violence, to be the fittest, be the strongest, you know, shoot to kill, all that stuff. That's your whole reward system. Then you take that into the civilian world and you start drinking like an animal, being violent and aggressive. Well, you, that doesn't really go too well. So you start having a few little incidents, and I sort of went down a bit of a spiral once I took off overseas just exploring the world that I got hooked into drugs in a fair way, became a drug addict and had that downward spiral until that rock bottom moment, woke up in jail, getting hosed down by the police. You know, I was covered in my own shit, just an absolute. It's a good Tuesday night. Absolute mess, you know, and made the shame of that moment. Well, it was a shame in the police officers' faces as they're hosing down this piece of shit human. That's what started the change. So that wasn't the bloke that I'd been brought up to be. I, I grew up. In the outback, loving parents, you know, the perfect upbringing. The military created a man, like, who was this piece of shit? So that was the turnaround point. So I was released from jail that next day, went home and got fucking loaded, like I was still in a bad way. But um, I called a buddy of mine that day. His name was Liam. He was back in Australia. I said, mate, I've got to get the fuck out of this city. Like I was in London. I've got to change my life. You know, what can I do? He was a, a mixed martial artist, and he told me to go to Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand in Phuket. He said, mate, go there, clean yourself up, do some training and try and sort your life out. So there I am booking my flight, high as a kite, you know, sitting in my little room in London, finished all my drugs in the taxi on the way to Heathrow and flew out as I started coming down and getting sick on the plane. And that was that was the turnaround, mate. So from then, it's it's been balls to the wall, life of adventure and living. That's fucking cool, man. Really, really cool. So when did you decide to plan life a max of five years in advance? It would have been after my Aconcagua expedition. So I did a big expedition down to South America to climb Aconcagua, which is the biggest one down there. And that's where I first encountered um, the dead climbers, which, which happened multiple times in the, in the years to come. But it was, it was that reality of one minute you're talking to some guys on the radio and three days later, He's laying there frozen, wrapped in a silver blanket. Oh, no shit. You actually knew these dudes. Well, we're all these different teams climbing a mountain, and this was the Spanish team that were pushing to the summit three days before us. They got caught in the storm, lost in whiteout conditions, died of exposure. Three days later, we're coming up on a perfect day, and and that's the outcome you see these guys, you know. So that made it real. So that's when that question took hold or that reality about death took hold and then it was just this game of of mental gymnastics I started thinking well shit it is going to come for me at any time how can I make the most of this newfound information so you start thinking oh okay what if what if it is all over in you know a year but 
the year time frame didn't really work because then it's just back to those base desires. You know, I'm going to go fucking do this. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to charge overseas, whatever. So that wasn't going to work. Then I thought, oh, 20 years. Well, that's too long because then you're going to get distracted by mortgages, careers, you know, these, these societal influences that are going to steer you a different way. And that's not going to be meaningful either. Five years was the sweet spot when I started playing this mental game. It was long enough to pull off some serious big projects, but not short enough to make it about base desires and, and pleasures. So that's where it ended up. Mm. Okay. And when you came face to face with these guys that were dead, right, you took a massive lesson out of it, but it, was it traumatic for you at the time or was it more like, you know, life hitting you around the back of the head with a brick and like, dude, you got to change what you're doing? The, the latter for sure. No, it, it wasn't traumatizing. I'd, I'd seen enough by that stage not to be overwhelmed by those types of emotions. It was just a reality. But I guess that could have been a bit of the desensitization and then indoctrination of the military machine. So you end up that way. You know, that stuff doesn't leave you. It's always there. You're always going to remember it. It's always going to come back at time to time. But no, I wasn't traumatized by that experience. If anything, it gave me a rocket up the ass to, to make the most out of life, you know. Hmm. 100%. That's super cool. So then, okay, so after you, what was the name of that mountain you climbed? So that, that was Mount Aconcagua. The biggest Aconcagua. In South America, yeah. Totally not going to remember how to pronounce that. So <laughs> what was the next one that you did after that? Actually, sorry, before we go into that, why climbing mountains? It's just where I ended up. So I, in my youth, I was reading a lot of books about adventures, you know, polar explorers, mountaineers. So when I was finally clean, so I went to this big training camp in Thailand, Tiger Muay Thai, awesome place when the world opens up, fucking your listeners have got to go there. Started doing six hours a day of Muay Thai and I couldn't fight. I was just a full piece of shit. So you're just struggling the whole time. At the end of a month, you're chemically clean. All that stuff's out of your system, the drink, the drugs and all the rest of it. But it wasn't until after the second month that, that everything was out and your dreams and aspirations and goals and all that stuff from your youth comes alive again you actually start becoming a human again so that's when this whole adventure thing took hold but I was also broke recovered addict had to go home and sort my life out and I was lucky I got a job in underground coal mining so I went straight underground doing 12 hours a day working these brutal jobs but for big big money stacking up this treasure chest of of my adventure fund and I was sitting in the mess just trying to figure out what adventure I want to do when I finally get enough money and I was just googling away and I found a list of the seven summits the biggest mountain on every continent and I thought, right, that's it. That's that's good to go. And I'm not going to take 10 years to do it. I'm going to do it all next year. And the first on the list was Aconcagua, but I had no bloody experience, no idea what I was doing. So I just bought every piece of equipment on that website and flew down to South America and joined a team going to climb. So that was number one. So that, that was it. You were literally sitting in a mess hall. You're like, fuck it. I'm going to do the top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So that was number one. And the second was uh, Denali up in Alaska. And that, that's, a, you know, one of my favourite ever expeditions because it is Alaska. It's that final frontier of adventure. You know, so many incredible adventure stories come out of that place. But the expedition itself had everything I'd read about. On Aconcagua, it's very much just a high-altitude stop, whereas on Denali, this thing, snow, ice, minus 20, 30s, you know, you're crossing crevasses, you're dragging sleds, wearing snowshoes, you know, you're doing all these different portages up and down the mountain. Like this was the real deal expedition. So that, that was amazing to have my second one be that one. And what was cooler about that one, like dragging your sleds and going through all that? Like what does that give you? Well, it's just so many new experiences. So I Cargo, it was super high, like higher than Denali and, and hard and challenging and all the rest of it. But, you know, there was no avalanche danger. There was no crevasses. There was no ice climbing, snow climbing, that sort of thing. But it was all, it was all a new experience because it was so high. So you had to deal with altitude. Then you get to Denali and every single day felt like a new experience. I was learning something. I was adapting to these, these new environments and all that. And people were dropping away. So we had a team because I was joining commercially guided expeditions in the beginning. We had a team of 10 people that start, but people are falling away due to the, the challenges of climbing this mountain. And as, you know, as sad as that was, because we're all a team, it was also energizing because as, as every person fall away, you're still going, well, that's a, that's a powerful thing. It's like, no, I've got this, let's keep going. And you know, I was fortunate on that one as well to make it to the summit uh, after that third week. We had a, a decent summit day. 
about minus 40 plus on top, freezing, but we got there. It was epic. And we did about a, it was almost a 24 hour straight push from camp three all the way back down to where the little plane was going to pick us up on the glacier because we had a big storm front coming in. And we thought, right, we can get there and get this plane, or we got to hang back and it might be stuck in the mountains for a week or two. So for a 24 hour endurance push all the way off through 24 the hours night, straight. Straight. Camp three to the base. What was um, that like? Brutal, brutal. Like you find these these energy stores and motivation in yourself that, that you've never found. Well, I touched on it in the military because to get into the infantry, you had to have that stuff. They break you to pieces and you had to find that, that new source. But I hadn't touched in years and years and years. So that was that was awesome. And that's something we sort of always try and replicate on expeditions these days. Like, oh, do we want to do we want to have a bit of a go here? Should we just give it a nudge and push out real hard just to test yourself and see if you still got it, you know? But that was amazing. Like through through the twilight, because in Alaska, in summer, the sun doesn't quite go down. So it just dips behind the mountains and it's just like this twilight for a number of hours and it comes back up again. And you're just, just going through this moonscape, ice and snow. We hit the bottom glaciers, which is probably the most dangerous part to be, at sort of the wrong time. We hit it about mid-morning as we're coming out on the bottom. So what happens on glaciers is you have all these big cracks in this frozen river Okay, so your crevasses, but then there's a snow layer on top. So during the night, that snow layer is frozen. But during the mid-morning, it turns into like the consistency of a slushy. So as you're walking along, you just start breaking through. So your leg will stick into this crevasse and you pull it out and there's this black hole below you. And these go down, you know, hundreds of metres. So oh, keep going. So you're all roped together for safety. So you're in teams of four. And uh, on, on our just about exiting off the glacier, our back guy, our assistant guide, straight through into the crevasse, cut through underneath the snow bridge, and he's just hanging there in the, uh, in the open. And so we work as a team. You drive your ice axes into the snow, set up a little pulley system and drag him out of there within sort of that half an hour. So all these new experiences. Half an hour? He's, ideally, he's ideally. dangling there half an hour, yeah. and it's like <laughs> hundreds of metres below. Well, he was lucky. He was only probably 15 metres down before the rope comes tight and hangs there in the abyss, but there's nothing below him. But also you have to get him out quick because even though it might be, you know, five or 10 degrees above the snow with the sun, down below it's minus 20, 30, and he hasn't got his down gear on, down suits and stuff. So he's just hanging there. you got to get him out before he freezes. Yeah, right. Okay, so on a good day, it's 30 minutes. He's swinging there. <laughs> yeah. On a bad day, how long does it take? Oh, mate, depends on the setup, depends on the experience of the, the team. You know, if it's just two of yours, it, it can be a lot longer. You know, so he might be trying to get his down gear out of his bag while he's down there. He might be banging in an ice screw onto the wall for safety, all sorts of things. So it just depends. And if How you're long until you die, like down there? Mate, depends on the person, hey. Hypothermia yeah. can set in really, really quick. But there's been stories of, you know, guys overnighting, on Everest above 8,000 for 24 hours and surviving, you know, losing all their fingers and toes, nose and ears, but surviving. Like the, the human spirit, you can't quantify in, you know, you die in two hours because some people won't, you know, it depends on your will to live. Yeah, it's super interesting that it's like you've got this little voice that ticks in, you know, when you're about, you know, when you're training, right, and you're about to pass out, you know, how you have that split second decision is like, do I pass out now or not? You know that one? Yeah, yeah. it's it's like that same thing, right? Yeah, we have that choice, and it, all that is 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 meaning. Is there enough going on in my life for for me to survive? So you can read some incredible stories of survival. You can go right back to you know Auschwitz, World War Two sort of stuff. Guys can be in the exact same condition, guys and girls, where you're living on nothing, hard labor, or you're stuck in the Arctic, you know, minus fifty, whatever. Some die within two hours. Others go overnight multiple days and survive because they've got a little kid at home that they have to get back to. That is their meaning. That's their will to live. So that's that's the thing. That there, whatever that is for someone, that's what can get you through the toughest stuff out there. What's you yours? Got that, mate, for me, life itself is my big one. Like I've got my beautiful wife and I've got my family and I've got everything else, of course, but I see life as this absolute gift every single day of it and for that reason i think it's such a waste to die why the fuck would i want to die that's one of the reasons i gave up 
you know, base jumping and why you turn around on big mountains when the storm is just raging because, you know, I could push and we might get there, but we might not. And what a fucking waste that would be. So that is my why is, is just not to waste this life then because you only got one. Hmm. What's yours? Good question, dude. My When I'm lifting and I'm going into that place, mine is solely like, fuck it, like just do it, just like this is it's it's a weird sense of enjoyment like when i was bodybuilding right like i'd i'd be starving i'd be fucking tired i'd be sore i used to dislocate like i i don't have the best joints so i used to dislocate my knee like most sessions oh. when i'd squat so i'd like pop my um my fibula out just just come out a little bit yeah. and so i was doing that and then i was doing like it's funny i haven't talked about it before i was doing like 3 hours of cardio on a day on this fibula that kept it was no was it my tibia it was one of them i had it like a torsion so it actually like twist and they actually oh, like slightly pop out and, and then pop the chiro, in and out pop in and out and Ooh. the chiro it, it was more out than in <laughs> but yeah. it was like in the chiro and every time like i have to see the chiro three times a week shout out to ian from 10 secrety because he just go and bang pop it back in <laughs> pop, it, pop it back in every week right <laughs> did that for a while but i remember that was the other thing I used to do is I, I fucking love Nutella, bro. Like I love Nutella. And like when I was dieting, right, I could obviously couldn't eat Nutella because I was dieting. So yeah. I'd have an open jar of Nutella in my bed. And that was the first thing I saw in the morning, the last thing I saw before bed so that I knew that if I fucked up and I slipped up on my diet, I knew. It was like no, no one else knew I had that. No one else knew about it. But I was like, you know, like if I would almost feel it'd be like a big, massive sense of shame if yeah. I gave in to that pain at that moment and just and just succumb to it, you know what I mean? And then from there, the rest of it in terms of like lifting and pointing, pushing to the point, like I had multiple times where I'd finish a set and I'd be like, you know, the nerve shakes that you get? Oh, yeah. Pushed a little bit too hard. It was like you used to get yeah. that like quite a bit. And then before then, I remember the thought in my head was, it was first of all ex- like exposure therapy, getting repeatedly comfortable with – being exposed to that extreme feeling of pain where you have that little voice in your head, which says, it's okay to pass out now. It's okay. Just put the weight down. Like it's all right. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. (laughs) And just becoming way more comfortable with that and then continually pushing on through that. And that actually became enjoyment in itself. So it wasn't like for me that there was an extreme meaning in that pain, but it was actually pleasurable in itself in being able to push through that and to continually, I guess, learn to be comfortable with that. Yeah. That was what it was. Does that make sense? Mate, it does. It does. Absolutely. So if I asked you that that five-year question, this might be a bit too deep to answer off the cuff. You've got to think about this stuff. But, you know, really convince yourself that Big JC has only got five years left, five years to make an impact. It's all over, mate. Believe it. What would you write down between now and then? What would be your list to go out and achieve in that five years kids number one there you go no brainer kids number one that's an easy one because soph and i are practicing at the moment we'll get it right soon enough but that's like it's good yeah practice is good it makes perfect right (laughs) Uh, i love practicing making kids bro it's the best then so practice so kids that'd be the first thing then the second thing after that is making it so that i am totally replaceable in what we're doing at jcf Mm -hmm. So at the moment, like we have some really fucking high level dudes and like our whole goal, our mission is like, I just want men to have like every man to be able to have integrity. One of the things that I pride myself on is that when I say something, I do it. And it's like, if if I agree to you, you know, with absolute certainty that I'm not going to go back on my word. Mm -hmm. And that's something which is really important to me. And I feel that it's very, very important for humans and for humanity generally, like for us as a species, it is important for our people, particularly our men, to be able to commit to their word. Because I've found that when men get their shit right, women just do their thing. Women are fucking awesome. Like they only start becoming out of integrity when a man fucks them up or does something bad in my experience. Mm -hmm. And so if we can make it so that, we can pass that on and we can get, you know, at the moment we're in the thousands of men who have worked with on doing that. It's like, okay, cool. How do we get into the millions and, and more than that? 
And the way that we'll do that is through me making it so that JCF doesn't stop with me so yeah. that when I die, it lives on and creating this organism, which is just like, it, it's, it's organic. It grows itself. It doesn't need me here anymore. Like yeah. the team have got it. The crew have it. And it's, it's not about my face, you know, use my face while it's here, but like, it's not about that. It's, it's, it can live on without me. Maybe the two biggest things by far. I and like then like after it. that, I'm not sure. After I mean, that. you're doing your thing for, you know, your bloodline. You're, you're putting those good genes back into the pool. You're doing your thing for society and everyone else. Where, what's yours? What is your thing, your one big thing, that personal value and meaning thing? And it's you know, a tough one. No, sometimes it takes a bit of drilling. Yeah, it, it is because I'm thinking about because it because it was bodybuilding before. Right. Yeah. And I did that and I did pretty well at it. And then in terms of the personal achievement, it the satisfaction I got from bodybuilding, like it was cool. It was fun. Like I really, really enjoyed it. But the once I stopped doing bodybuilding and I stopped it, like I used to be really self-centered, you know, like really fucking self-centered. I mean, a standard bloke coming up with insecurity and issues. You name it a sport too, though, you know. You have to. It's so fucking hard. you got to be a 100%. bit ego-driven, a bit selfish, you know. Totally. And I guess you could probably say that for most, most sports and most athletes, right? But in terms of like personal achievement, I, I found that the greatest satisfaction I got wasn't from me. It was from other people. Like we, we just got chickens, dude. I think I told you. Yeah. Like, we just got, got three chickens. Like I love these chickens. And <laughs> the satisfaction I get from teaching these chickens to do things and like working with them and, and, and doing all that sort of stuff is so much greater than me going and doing it myself. So I guess I haven't found my own personal one yet because I do have this attachment to, I guess you'd call it service or whatever you call that. I definitely have that attachment there. But no, long answer, sorry, short answer to, to a very long-winded answer is <laughs> I don't know yet and I'll have to think on that. Do you feel that we need to have our personal mission? Mate, some people don't, but I think a lot of people should ask themselves that question because as you're trying to drill a bit of integrity and old school morals and values back into men, I think a lot of people have just lost that true meaning of why we're here. What's this all about? You know, and we get trapped in in the structures of career and mortgage and, and you know, kids can be a, a social structure too if you just go down that route because everyone's doing it, you know. And next thing you know, 50 years has gone by and you haven't done what you've really wanted to do with your life. Hmm. You know? So I think... No, not everyone would need that that question answered, but I think a lot of people would, and they get a lot of value out of it. Hmm. Sure. So, how do you go about finding yours, mate? I mean, lot, lots of reflection, and that's I guess a lot of big expeditions are so monotonous and hard. You spend a shitload of time in your brain, so you get to drill down into some deep, deep, dark places and figure out, you know, what you really want out of life. And I think pushing it with the military, pushing it you know, with the drugs down to that sort of dark hole and then pushing it into extreme adventures where you, you know, you are almost getting clipped a couple of times, well, then that true life or death meaningful stuff is just there on the surface. But I guess the fortunate thing for me is my whole life has always, every time I answer that question, it comes back to big expeditions, bigger, longer, harder, more interesting, more exposed, more remote. So I know, you know, my own path is on the right path because that's what keeps coming out for me. What is it that the big, long, hard, difficult, extreme, hazardous expeditions, like what, what does that do for you? Oh, mate, so much. Apart from, you know, knowing your, your true limits, like the physical limits, which I don't think I've hit yet, considering, yeah, some of the stuff I've done, but the physical limits, that mental capacity, what you can achieve if your if your brain is on board with the rest of your physical body so that psychophysical wholeness but then mate the experiences like when you're talking about you know your Nutella or your bodybuilding and you're getting those dopamine hits from that pain well mate when you're jumping off a cliff plummeting towards the earth and you save your own life with a parachute or you know when you summit that mountain after a month of just punishment the dopamine hit and the adrenaline that whole cascade of hormones is is it's just like an addiction. It's just another extreme addiction. And that in itself keeps me coming back for more. But then as you're saying about leaving a legacy and, and 
you know, taking JC out of the equation so your thing can flow on. Well, mine's always been about telling the stories as well. So I do these, you know, big expeditions, learn some lessons. Then you go and share it. You talk to people. You, know, you write your stories down. You get those stories out there because you want people to learn these valuable lessons because, you know, 99.9% of people won't be going to throw themselves off a cliff or a building or climb a mountain, but they can still get some value out of the risks that I'm taking. What lessons do you normally teach on? Or what, what do people learn from you? Mate, I've got a few key ones. I mean, over the years, it's evolved. In the beginning of these big expeditions, I still had a huge ego. So it was about the records and the fast ascents and, you know, just some to tell stories around a dinner table, you know, a bit, bit of a gloating sort of thing. Over the years, it's evolved into to far more than that. It's all about life experience. So the biggest lessons I've taken away well, the big one from all the mountaineering. So that year culminated in my first big adventure year. I went to Denali, climbed that one, went down to Antarctica and climbed a big mountain down there called Vincent Massive. I went to Tanzania to bump off Kilimanjaro. I went to West Papua to climb a mountain over there called Karsten's Pyramid in the jungle. Then went over to um, Russia to climb Mount Elbrus and I failed a couple of times on Elbrus, didn't get to summit. And then I ran out of money that year to go and climb Everest. So I wrote the whole year off as a failure because I hadn't achieved my big objective. You know, I was still ego driven and my thing was that that list of seven mountains. So it was a big failure. But looking back, all the experiences I'd had, all the skills I'd accrued were incredible. But that biggest lesson from that year was about confronting death. Yeah, as we've just discussed, that five-year question, seeing all those guys dying along the way, well, that's where I finally even after the military confronted death for the first time, ask myself that five-year question and then go about living it. So that's one of my big lessons, you know, when I do my talks. After that, I go into, you know, ocean rowing and, and that's probably the most suffering I've ever endured on expeditions. Ocean rowing is a particular type of sport. It takes everything you've got to try and, to try and get across these oceans. And on my crossing of the Atlantic with our team, um, the Road to Rio team, that broke me like broke me down to a point where I thought no I can't do this and I hadn't been to that point you know since infantry school where you ask yourself that question and I had to come up with some way to to get over all that pain and suffering because we were doing two hours of rowing two hours of rest 24 hours a day just going for it sleep deprivation battling the seas getting punished and I come up with this little mantra that I'm laying in my tiny little, in like it's a cab, but it's like a cell that you seal the door and it's like airtight and watertight. That's your only bit of safety on this rowboat. So I'm in there and I come up with this little mantra because I was really struggling and I actually used masking tape on the top of the, the roof of the little cab and wrote it there so I'd read it every 90 minutes when I'd wake up. And it was, be grateful, you deserve this, thank you for allowing me to suffer. And so that thank you for allowing me to suffer was the, big lesson I took out of ocean rowing because when I started to think about hold on dickhead like you're out here having a crack at a world record you've got the physical and mental ability to do it yeah there is millions of people out there that trade spots with you in a second you know so just try and be grateful for this this suffering this disgusting hard rubbish that you're going through every every couple of hours be grateful for it because it's a privilege And even though that's just a mental gymnastic type game, when I started to be grateful for these experiences, no matter how hard they were, the intensity of the pain of that suffering got turned down just a little bit. Not enough to make it easy by a long way, but enough so you could get up time and time and time again and just go about it. So that was a big lesson I took away from that ocean rowing experience. And that's another another one of the big ones I put out there. Mm. So it's almost like you, instead of focusing purely on the goal and getting there, it was being going back into that moment and being totally present there with the pain. You have to, mate. I mean, this this objective we set ourselves was 6,400 kilometres of rowing, right? And to have a crack at the world record, you couldn't touch land, you couldn't have a support boat, you had to be fully self-sustained. To even think about, you know, the what we thought was going to be 70 days of rowing in its entirety in the beginning, well, you just give up. It's like, no, fuck, no chance. So you had to cut it back. You had to cut it back into, we had like five different stages. And then you cut those stages down into all the different days. Then each day becomes 12 rowing shifts. And then those shifts become six day shifts, six night shifts. Then they become a two hour block. You know, then you cut it down to your 90 minutes of sleep. So you just focus on that 
okay, 90 minutes sleep time, prep my body, I'm wiping all the salt off me, you know, put the pseudo cream fucking everywhere, Vaseline all over you, have a feed, drink, down, 90 minutes. All right, next objective, get through this rowing shift, two hours. Crawl out, go for it. Back, 90 minutes. So you're just taking these micro bites at this massive task that we'd set ourselves. And that's how you had to chew it up. It was just too hard. When you were sleeping only 90 minutes at a time, right, that's not a... The best for your recovery of a sleep. Right? You get a little bit catabolic, I must say. <laughs> a little, a little bit. So, did you start? So, one of the things that happens when you don't get REM sleep, you don't get the dreaming phase of sleep, is when you're when you're not sleeping, you don't get that. You end up dreaming through the day. Did you start to hallucinate at all through that? On the night shifts, for sure, for sure. The thing about the human system is it's so adaptable. So after those first few weeks where your body goes through all these transitions of seasickness and then just dealing with the pressure sores on your ass because you're sitting for that long and all the rest of it, those 90 minutes, you would fall asleep within three seconds. As soon as your head went down, bang, you're out. And you was a deep sleep. After 90 minutes, you wake up and it felt like in those initial seconds, you'd had eight hours. But then your energy tank wasn't there. Two hours later, you're like, oh, I need another 90 minutes, okay? So I think the deep sleep might have been there, but the hallucinations at night when there was no lights, you're out there in that sort of midnight to 2 a.m. shift, brutal, getting smashed with cold waves, you, you go into those dream states. But you, you learn to love that. It's almost like a, like a runner's dream state where, oh, 10 Ks has gone past. Well, if I can get into that state and just go off a little bit hallucinating, a little bit dreamlike, you know, down some rabbit holes in my mind, two hours goes. The worst shifts were that sort of midnight to two where every second felt like a fucking hour and it was just torture, absolute torture. And then you're crawling back in some misery states and, you know, you've got to be back at it 90 minutes later. So if you can tap into that dream state, that's ideal. I don't know if it's healthy or not. I'll have to ask you about that. Well, what is that dream state that you're referring to? Mate, it could just be imagination. The imagination you had as a kid that you sort of de-evolve from as you become an adult with all anxieties and stresses. You don't imagine anything because you always got your bloody phone in your face anyway. Whereas when your phone's not there and you're just doing this monotonous endurance thing, sort of like your three hours of cardio, your brain just starts going. And if you can, and it actually, it's a growing thing. So in the early stage of an expedition, you might tap into it for five minutes. You go, oh, geez, I haven't had that in a while. But then you'll go into it for hours, hours at a time. When we were doing a big expedition on a, on a desert crossing where you're doing literally 12 hours of just walking through a desert a day, you'd go into it for multiple, multiple hours. And at the end of the day, you'd be talking, to them, oh, how's your day? Oh, real good. I was, I was off doing this. I was planning this. I built a fucking house in my mind, you know, all these little things. And so it becomes a bit of a tool to be able to handle that monotonous punishment hours after hours. So it's almost like lucid dreaming. I guess so, yeah. Imagination. It's just imagination, you know. Kids running around the bush playing bloody army men and pirates and all that sort of stuff, stuff you haven't done since you're a little kid. You know, that's all it is. You're tapping into that again. Hmm. At first, when you first tap into that world, you go into all your bloody trauma, all your sort of traumas, you know, your regrets and people you might have wronged or past relationships. You're digging through all that shit. But after a while, it just comes back to fun. So I always plan new expeditions or, you know, whatever's going on in my mind at that stage, I'll pull up at sort of break time and I'm writing stuff down. And I go, oh, that'd be a fucking great trip. Let's plan that one. And, you know, Elise always clips me for it. She goes, hold on, dickhead. One expedition at a time, please. Get through this first. <laughs> so I do have to rein it in sometimes. You, you need that. That's what Safe does to me as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Very yeah. important. Like, so, oh, so, so, you got, so when you're going into that dream state, you're going in and you have all that shit and all that trauma and all that sort of stuff comes up. So is it confronting? Is it healing? Like what's that like? And what's the effects of being and going through all that stuff? May well now you talk you're getting into the space of being able to control your emotions, you know. So all an emotion is, is is energy in motion. So if you tap into some of this old regret and then you let it start to have you, so you're not controlling it, it starts you know, overtaking you. Well, your heart rate's coming up, you know, you might have a bit of that stress response, your traps are jacking up, you're starting to have a bit of anxiety, you know, and that's all negative. You don't want to deal with any of that stuff because that has, you know, an effect on the body. That's that fight or flight response that's just going to shut down your recovery, shut down your system so it's not functioning at an optimal level. 
So it's a bit of a fine balance. We had to tap into some of those old things, like when I think about the addiction days and all the violence and the army and all that stuff, be able to have that emotion but not be had by it. That's the skill. That's something you have to control. Otherwise, you're walking around getting fucking angry, you're yelling, and next thing you're crying, and you, at, the, at the end of the day, your system is just shut down. And if you go about that sort of process, stuck in that fight or flight, you know, sympathetic nervous system all the time, you're only going to get sick. You're only going to get disease and disorder. It can't be any other way. So when you're, when you're going through and you're looking at that trauma, is there any part of it which is actually healing or is it more a part of you being able to accept and then move through it? It's not like you're doing CBT or some sort of psychology or psychiatry in yourself. Is it like that or is it more like something else where you're just able to push it aside and not be affected by those emotions? Yeah, like you don't want to dig it up. You, you just acknowledge that it's there. Like my past is my past. Yeah. I can't change that. And to be honest, you never want to change your past. You don't want to go and dig it up and figure out reasons why and blame and all that sort of stuff because it's created who I am. Good, bad, or indifferent, this is fucking me. And so you go back, you acknowledge that that's there, and you move on. And that's sort of the problem with some of the therapies that are out there today is we take people back we dig it all up so all those big emotions come back and then they're just fucking frazzled. And so, well, guess what? You're frazzled because, you you know, you dug up all that shit. It's the past. You deal with the system as it is now. What do we got? These are all the ingredients we've got, good, bad, or indifferent. Let's move forward. So that's what you always try and do. So even though I'm going down these dreamscapes and you might acknowledge all these things that have happened, mm. You know, I've dealt with all that. That's all gone. That's past. And, you know, writing my books has been a big therapeutic process of that as well because it's like once it's written down, done, I've told it truthfully, fuck everything, I'm done, that's it. Now we're only moving forward. I think that's the, the people should look at their lives that way. It's like my past is my past, good, bad, or indifferent. This is who I am today. How am I going to move forward? Mm. I love that, man. And particularly about what you said around the mental health treatments that we have now. Like we we obviously work with a lot of guys who have depression, anxiety, because most guys have depression and anxiety these days. And it's amazing how ineffective most psychology is because mm-hmm. you're right. Like the, the, these dudes will come to us and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I talked to my shrink today. I was like, oh, how do you feel? fucking crap <laughs> it's like terrible <laughs> just gone and relived all that shit again and it's and it shows in their biomarkers as you said like their traps will get tight their aura ring data gets terrible their sleep goes to shit all that sort of stuff whereas if we live in the present we live in now and we we don't look at that crap it it's so much like that in itself is like really healing like oh, really good. really cool Absolutely. And the best thing that, you know, you've discovered this whole mental health aspect through your bodybuilding, and I've been the same, where, okay, now you, you tell someone, okay, move on with your life. So, oh, how do I, how do, I do that? So, well, you sort of have to be able to train for these emotional bullets that are going to be fired at you from the environment time and time again. So, how do you do that? So, you know, take bodybuilding or any sort of strength conditioning program, for example. You start someone on something super lightweight, they're moving through that exercise and you see their traps jacking up. They're getting all anxious and stressed. They say, oh, hold on there, Barry. Just calm all that down, mate. You're having a bit of a, you know, fight or flight response, bit of a sympathetic type response. Just calm all that down and then we'll keep going. Well, now you've just made a, a critical change to how they've handled that emotion, how their perception of their environment has now changed. So first they were stressed and anxious and now they're calm and composed. So now they walk out the gym they're going around in life and they get hit with a little bit of stress, well, you've given them a tool to be able to deal with that. Yeah, you've taught them how to control that. So they're not going to get all jacked up. They go, oh, okay, that's all, no worries. Water off a duck's back, we'll just keep cruising. So those life tools that you put in that practical way through training are so much more valuable than going back and just digging up the past and then telling people, now, whenever you have that experience, just sit there and, and be quiet and, and just think about it. Fuck that. That's not going to change anything. You can sit there for 10 years, be in the bush, and you're not going to develop the robust skills you need to take on the big bad world. you got to fucking train your body, train your mind more importantly, because everything comes through the mind. All information is processed up here before it has a physical response. So when you are like rowing for two hours on 90 minutes off and so on for, for weeks on end, you'll get a little stress response right in there somewhere. <laughs> so like, yeah. it, do you go with that stress response or is your method to, this is simple, this is easy, this is fun. Thank you for allowing me to suffer. Like those, those sorts of things. 
Like, is it that where you accept it and you say it's not actually that bad? Like, how do you do it? No, it's full acceptance. You hit, you hit it on the head. So it's all about acceptance. You have to shut off the rest of your life. So I'm not Luke Richmond, you know, traveling the world, giving talks, this, that, and the other. I am a piece of equipment sitting in a boat and I'm going to row. This is my new life. So that's all I'm going to do. And when you lose 15 kilos of hard-earned muscle, when you get boils all over your backside and everything's getting infected and you've got rashes everywhere, it's like, well, that's just, this is me now. I am an Oceanella. This is what I'm going to do until it's over. So you have to sort of fully consolidate, give up on everything else and just focus on the task at hand. When you do that and you stop stressing about, oh, I've got to get through this because I've got to get home or you know, I've got to get to safety or I've got to get my body back to where it was, when you just be happy to be there, you're dealing with the suffering, this is who I am now, I'm a part of a machine, let's go, well, then you're not having those you know, emotional you know, turmoils through the body all the time. So you're not stressing, you're not anxious, your body then adapts. The fastest way to adaption is to be in that parasympathetic state, as you know. If you're always jacked up, stressed, and anxious, you can put in 10,000 hours of training, you're going to get so much result. If you're over here calm, composed, in a good state all the time, those 10,000 hours of training, you're going to have 10,000 hours of result. Yeah? So now you're there rowing away, you are now in a state that's called soft assembly. So whatever information is coming in, your body's going to adapt. So because there's so much fucking physical tax coming in, not many calories, the body adapts by dumping muscle. So the first thing to go, any muscle that's not getting used. So we're doing pulling motions, your chest is gone. Your quads are gone. Your ass is just deflated. Like you're losing all this muscle that you don't need until you're just this efficient rowing machine. That's it. And your body adapts. And so then when you come off expedition and you're back in your nice, wholesome environment, eating your good food, sleeping well, you're having sex again, your dick's working, like the whole lot. When you're in that perfect growth state, the body adapts again. So I'll put on two kilos a week after expeditions. It just piles on. The strength gains take months to come back, but the weight comes back on because your body's like, oh, okay, he's back now. He's in a good environment. He's not stressed or anxious. He wants to grow. Let's grow. So it's like a, it's, a, it's a total removal of comparison when you have that acceptance. There's no comparing to this life of comfort. It's like when you're in that moment of suffering and you accept it, there is nothing else. It's just like this is life now. This is how it's always going to be. That's it. And acceptance creates the composure that allows for that adaption, that allows for the whole process to take place in a healthy way. You know, losing that much weight and putting yourself through these tortures wouldn't be considered healthy in a lot of people's books, but it can be done in a healthy way, as opposed to the trauma of POW camps where they're thrown in situations where they don't want to be in, for one, stressed, fearing for your life, locales, the body just disintegrates and everything that goes along with it. So that's a totally different ballgame compared to putting yourself in an environment, staying composed, enjoying the process and dealing with it. Your body will adapt. Have you ever been in an uncomfortable situation? Obviously not a POW camp, but like have you ever been in an uncomfortable situation where you've had to apply, so not an uncomfortable, a, a situation which you didn't choose where you've had to apply this acceptance? Yeah, well, mate, you're, you're talking about loss of control. Control is everything, hey? So on that expedition to Papua, that expedition took a bit of a turn at the end because we'd climbed this peak and we'd come back down to the base camp but to get to the mountain, we had to come through the jungles of West Papua and we had to employ a whole bunch of locals to get there to carry all, all the expedition gear. So we ended up employing 19 different guys from all these different villages on the way. They brought their you know, brothers and sisters and friends and dogs and we had a huge entourage of people. We got to the base camp. They went back down the valley to sleep in this massive cave while we climbed the mountain Long story sort of nailed down, a slab of rock come off that cave system, crushed one of the porters, killed him. They come up the valley, well, thought that he died. They come up the valley to kill one of us. Spears, machetes, slashing the ground, all the rest of it. We managed to calm the system down, calm the whole situation down, sorry. And then myself and another guide went back down the valley to assess the body because there's very much an eye for an eye over there. These elders of the tribe, so these guys have got bows and arrows, wooden penis tubes. It's still quite primitive. So wooden it's just penis tube? Yeah, they put their, they put their schlong in the, in the side of the like, tube in the bottom, but then the tube comes up over the shoulder like this. It's almost like a, like a phallus statue, you know, a bit of a 
entitlement thing. I don't know. Elders. Anyway, it's it's funny. It's funny. You see it in my books. <laughs> I wanted one, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, you don't have those genetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, it was an eye for an eye. So in this situation where Dean and I, the guide, were like, fuck, mate, we're walking down into an ambush for, for sure. We're probably going to get chopped up down here, but there's no way out of this. We can't go into the jungle without these guys. We get back down into the cave or down into the cave system. You know, when you come across, or you might not know, but you come across a trauma, you sort of just go into your doctor ABCs, danger response airways. So we're checking the body. And this dude, even though he had clear stuff coming from the ears, smashed up head, blood everywhere, had a tiny rise and fall of the chest. So he was just hanging on with life. He was only a young guy, you know, maybe late teens, early 20s, right? First we thought, okay, he hasn't died. We're good here. We can, we can save this dude. But then we couldn't get him back through the jungle. That's seven days through the thickest jungle you've ever seen. So that's not going to happen. On the other side of the mountain, there's a, a huge open cut mine. And it's run by Freeport Mines. It's massive humanitarian rights issues. They're under attack by the Free Papua movement all the time. Like it's a war zone. That was their only chance to try and help this kid. So we built a, a stretcher out of a couple of poles and tarps, humped him up over the mountain, got him to the side of the mine. We raised up, we sort of went out and sort of hailed down one of the mining trucks. Security come down, mine ambulance came down and they took this kid away and we thought we've saved the day, Yeah. That night, we were talking to the elders because we had to go back through the jungle the next day and we just threw a couple of hypothetical questions to them through our interpreter. You know, if this kid dies tomorrow or the next day and we end up back in your village of Shagapa and his family's there, what happens then? Because we still had to fly out of there. You know, you can't go anywhere. And they couldn't give us a straight answer. So we ultimately ended up ditching all of our porters and half of our gear traveling up over the mountains, surrendering ourselves to the mine to hopefully get them to let us out the other side down to another town where we could fly out. Bad timing. The night before the Free Papua Movement had attacked, they'd burnt a mining vehicle, killed a couple of miners, so the whole place was on lockdown. We get arrested and thrown in a shipping container. So now we've got this loss of control. So we're not in charge of anything anymore. We ended up staying there for a full week, so like seven days, until one of the mine managers, it's a, it's a, bit, of a bit of a long story this one, but uh, the short story is one of the mine managers comes down at two in the morning on the seventh day with all this mining gear, dresses us all up as miners, smuggles us out of this area to a waiting helicopter down to a waiting airliner that flew us out to Bali. How did that happen? How did it, it- a whole week of international pressure from the embassies and, and everyone else that knew we were in this situation putting the pressure onto the mine management team, but they didn't have control over the security force because these guys were like an Indonesian special forces mob. And now, friendly enough, you know, I was chatting to them about rifles and all sorts of things. But so he had to sort of smuggle us out of there during a security changeover when they weren't there at like two in the morning to a waiting helicopter. But even as you're getting on that chopper, you're scanning the windows, waiting for the security to roll in and just shut the whole show down because I think they're trying to ransom us out of there, you know. But we got to the airline, flew out to Bali, and I got fucking drunk as <laughs> in Bali. <laughs> so long story, that was a bit of a loss of control in that container. And, yeah, everyone handles it differently. I still had that young military brain, so I'm like, fuck this. If this goes on for a second week, I'm heading through the jungle, making it to the coast, and I'll just follow the coast all the way to Moresby in Papua New Guinea or something. You know, you start thinking that way. So I was already thinking about these survival things that could happen. Their other team members, two days in, are bawling and crying and, and losing all composure because they'd never been in a situation where you've lost control like that. Yeah, they're in worlds where you can control everything to a certain degree. So that loss of control broke them and they had to try and rebuild themselves to be able to deal with what was going on. It was tough. How did you manage them? Uh, just talking, you know, talking, mate, as best you can, you know, going from your own experiences, telling them, it's all going to be sweet. Like, there's nothing going on here. We're not getting bashed. They're bringing us food every day. It's not the greatest bit of rice and chicken in the world, but they're feeding us. They let us out to use the toilet. Like this is a good environment. It's all going to be okay. It's just going to be a long week. Well, we didn't know at that stage. We thought it'd be a few days, kept going and going and going for the week. But yeah, you just talk them around, mate. Try and get them back under control, of those emotions, because it's not a good place to be when you're in that stressed state. As you know, all your cognition deteriorates. You don't make good decisions. You don't, you know, react well to anything. So you had to try and just rein them in a bit and 
and it all come good in the end. It was exciting. So it was exciting. Yeah, sounds awesome, dude. <laughs> this is sick. I want to do that. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> so so then, okay, so after that experience, did you have any hesitations at getting back on the, on, on the horse and going out and doing another expedition or were you just straight back into it? Nah, straight back into it, mate. If anything, there was, there was a good bit of media attention after that one, you know, for all the wrong reasons, but that sort of, you know, helped a little bit so you can just crack on. What was but, the media um, attention? Well, just because we were detained in that container, the media got hold of it. So then, you know, across the papers, but out where I was mining, it's like miner, trapped, papa, and all these different things. It was good. Made it in the news. It's hard getting in the news these days, mate. You know, with all the clickbait, it's, uh, I get like 60 seconds of fame after each expedition and then they flick it back to the football. So that yeah. was good. Or, or some chick with big tits, like that's <laughs> it. <yeah. laughs> hundred percent, hundred percent. So so what did you do next after Papua? That was Elbrus. And so even the extract off Elbrus, so I was, this is like close to the end of the year now. I'd climbed, what was that? Five mountains successfully, you know? So my ego would have been getting all these ego hits. And mate, you're crushing this, you're fit, you're strong. You've got all these skills now. I don't need a commercially guided expedition anymore. I just hired a Russian dude and we're going to hit this peak because it's technically not a hard peak, this one. And so we start hitting it fast as we're climbing well. We get up to camp two, myself and his name's Valentin. And then we decide to push from camp two all the way to the summit and back. So I camp one all the way to summit and back, skipping camp two. We had one good crack at it. And as we're about maybe four hours from the top of the top of the peak, Mother Nature just said no. The wind comes up, straight in your face. Then you know it all starts going wide out, super cold. So we turned it around and hightailed it. All the way back down to camp one. I had fucked up in my planning of this expedition. Russia's very tough visas and all the legalities and all that shit, but I had a seven day window to hit this mountain. So we're already at sort of the fifth day at this point. So I, I needed to get it this next day, or it just wasn't going to happen. I had to get out of the country. So the very next midnight, we're up again, head torches, hot brews, and then we start up at like 1 a.m., pushing up this mountain fast, feeling good, feeling strong. And it was just a repeat of the day before, about two hours from the top. Mother Nature said no. Big afternoon storm starts pounding us. We're hiding behind these rocks for a while. And I, don't, I didn't know anything about big storms or making decisions in that type of environment. So I, I, refer, I you know, deferred it to Valentine and said, mate, what do you reckon? And in his sort of Russian accent, he said to me, it's better to come to the mountains 10 times and go home than to come once and never go home. And so I knew when he said that, like it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I said, yeah, no, you're right, mate. I get it. I get it. So we turn around and we start fighting our way down. Over on on another ridgeline off to, I think it was like east of the peak, there was this crashed helicopter. Been there for ages, this massive sort of like old Chinook style bloody thing, a big bastard on its side. Valentine said, let's go hide out in the wreckage, get away from the wind, and, you know, maybe we'll have another crack later on if the wind goes down. It's like, beautiful. So push over there, claw open this uh, door on the side of this thing. We get inside, shut off all that wind, turn around, and then I've got this rifle pointing straight at my head. And so there's this Russian soldier in there whose job it was to protect this downed aircraft. And he's whacked his AK-47 straight in my face, screaming at us. Valentine screamed at him and made those bloody seconds, they feel like minutes when you got a, a muzzle shoved in your face, yeah, until Valentine's telling him all what we're doing and he calms it down, lowers the rifle, but he wouldn't let us stay, forced us back out into the storm and we had to fight our way down. So that was the end of, of that expedition. But in that moment, you've got total loss of control again. So getting back to, to our point we're discussing, like you don't know what's going to happen. You are at the whim of this guy. You know, I could see the, the knurling inside the muzzle, mate, it was that close to your face. And that's not a good place you ever want to be. You always want to try and have control. But if what we know as humans living in a greater environment is you can never control your outside environment. But what you can control is how you respond to it, your perception of it and your behavior. You can control everything to do with that. And that's the power. Mm. So why was that dude guarding the helicopter? Oh, mate, there's this thing in the army like intelligence, right? So even though this thing is fucking old, Russians would have been on that same ballpark. So, oh, there's some technology in this chopper we need to secure. So what happens in war zones is if you can't stay with the 
broken vehicle, downed aircraft, whatever, while they frag the whole thing. They burn it, blow it up, whatever, because you don't want your enemies getting hold of any technology that's in that aircraft. So that's why he's there. It would have been the worst fucking posting ever, sitting in that <laughs> chopper on top of this mountain, freezing your ass up. Bloody hell. That's when you know you piss someone off. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you, you fucked up, man. Yeah, you off fucked you up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, but so, so out of that, so the big thing for you is is that always try and maintain control when you can. But if you can't, then you have to accept. For sure, absolutely, mate. Accept it, but control your perception, control your response to any stress that's coming in from the environment. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a muzzle in the face. If it's traffic, if it's you know your boss yelling at you, whatever it is, you can control your arousal. And your composure in that situation so you don't lose control. So what's the next adventure for you? Oh, mate, what have we got? We've had a few micro ones since the COVID, you know, craps kicked off. We did a little kayak of the Murray. We cycled a couple of mountain bikes across Australia, just doing trails here and there. But I've bought myself or actually donated. I got donated a surf boat from Forest Beach Surf Life Saving Club way up in North Queensland. So you know these surf boats, they're like, you know, the five-person Big yeah. boats to go out and see, yeah. Got one of them. So I'm dropping it off actually Monday. They're going to gut it out, put in two rowing seats. And we're going to build some outriggers off it, like the old Polynesian days. Solar outboard at the back with solar panel canopy. And the first trip we're going to do with it, apart from a few test runs around here in Tassie, is to go from Townsville around to Weeper. Just coastal rowing, exploring rivers, fishing, shooting, doing all that good fun redneck stuff and end up in Weeper. So that's the trip for Easter next year. That's the next big one. Why that? Mate, it's just got uh, – it'll take me back to my youth. So I was in the army up there in Townsville, and I mm. went to high school in Ingham. So I spent a lot of time in North Queensland fishing and running around like a little redneck. So I love all that stuff. So it'll take me back there. I'll get to show Elise all that. It'll also give us a bit of ocean rowing stuff, explore the reefs. It just has stuff I haven't done. you know. And the thing with all of my expeditions, I'm never – trying to do one thing. I don't just want to do mountaineering. That's that's the bread and butter, and I always go back to it every couple of years doing another peak. But I loved ocean rowing. I loved crossing deserts, dragging carts. I loved the base jumping stuff, the cycling, kayaking, like try everything. So this is just something we haven't done, and we'll see how it goes. And so speaking of your relationship, you, by the way, are you okay to talk about that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So one of the big issues like most dudes – have like particularly in business is you're working a lot you're not often home and then all that sort of stuff and it's difficult to maintain a relationship and then here's you and you're like going away all around the world doing this stuff which is highly likely to get you killed relative (laughs) to an average you know human right so how do you guys manage that within your relationship well mate it had to evolve so the first big trip after I first met Elise well we met in Sydney when we're running the gym there so it's our second gym, running the gym. And as you know, running business, you're working your ring out seven days a week. you got all that stress and happiness was just at a minimum. So that puts pressure on the relationship anyway. But I knew Elise was the right one for me when after about 18 months of the business, I said, well, look, I'm just not happy. And she asked me, well, when were you, when were you happy? What do you, what do you do that makes you happy? And so I was, I was happy, you know, real happy when I was training in Thailand, just you know, living the dream, climbing, doing all this stuff. And she goes, oh, let's go do that. I said, right, this, this girl, she's, she's the one for me. We sold the business, sold every possession we had and just pissed off to Thailand. Within six months of making that decision, we were gone. So I knew, okay, she, she's the one for me. Six months later, I'm off rowing an ocean, going through all that, you know, saga while she wasn't there. And that was tough. You know, being apart, I'm giving her a sat phone call every four days, you know, having a bit of a sook or, you know, she's trying to tell me what she's doing, but it was hard being apart. So from that moment, she decides, no, nah, fuck that. You're not doing that anymore unless I'm coming. So she starts coming on all these big expeditions and she's been with me on every one except one since then. And she yeah, loves the big adventure life. So we're lucky now that after, you know, overnight success, 12 years down the line, you've done enough big adventures, you can get booked for speaking, you can sell enough books, you can make a bread and butter living from the adventure world. So we don't have to deal with you know, that stress of a normal job where you've lost a bit of control. You can dictate how you want to live every single day. Yeah. How do you make money out of books these days? Like that's such a foreign concept to me. Like how, how do you do that? Mate, I'm old school. I'm old school. So 
when you first get into the publishing world, my first book was traditionally published. So they do all the work. It goes in all the bookstores around the bloody world and you make fuck all. Like you make a dollar a book. If it sells for $32.99 in the store, you get a dollar. So I realized pretty quickly that you can't live on that. I don't know many writers that ever could. Down here in Tasmania, there's a huge market. It's called Salamanca Market. So on Saturdays there, I sell my books. So when the second book came around, I self-published everything. And I got the rights of my first book back. So I do all my own printing, control, every aspect of production. Then I go on face-to-face sales every Saturday down here. And pre-COVID, you can make a lot of sales in a day. But then when I go into my speaking gigs, boom, there's another whole lot of sales. You've still got all your books online as well, but that's just trickling through. But to make that margin where you can make, you know, $20 a book as opposed to 90 cents, that's what I do. I'm a face-to-face salesman. You have that real interaction. You're telling your stories. They buy your two books. Then they're sending you emails and they're off planning their own trips. So you make a good little bit of wedge. You have a great impact on someone's life. And it's just this awesome little scenario. That's super cool. So, so how do you self-publish? Like, how does that work? May there's a few different processes you can go down depending on the quality of the publication you think you have, whether you just want to pump it out into that ebook market as a little add-on to your business, or whether you've written a quality book with a really good story that you want to get out there. Well, then you can employ the right people. So I went and sort of don't do your research on who the really good editors are, who the really good typesetters are, who the really good cover designers are, and the good printers. So there's this whole process, okay? That process might take you six to nine months to bring to fruition from a rough draft. Now, for me, I can finish my rough draft, get it off to my editor for the first, you know, first round of editing, and then all the way to the end, it might cost me to have the first thousand landed here about 14 grand. That is the top of the pops of self-publishing. That's spending the money on the real good people to have a, a really, really good quality product at the end of the day. Underneath that, there's a million different ways you can do it. Subpar editing, you know, quick editing, you can just do rough type setting, rough design, whatever. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways depending on people's budgets to do the stuff. With the audio book world, you can record your own, you know, rough edit your own and then send it off to a you know, proper sound editor. So you can get those out on Audible and all that stuff as well. So there's lots of different ways you can do it. But as you know, mate, in this entrepreneurial world, you do the work. you got to put in the bloody hours. I was in that cupboard in my fucking room reading your own book into a speaker for probably six months. And it's hard. I don't know if you've ever read it. Reading it into a speaker? Yeah. So when you say you're going to do your Audible, right? So you've got your book and you have to get it recorded. So you're reading it. So you're reading away, but you make so many mistakes when you read out loud. So every five seconds, you know, you're making these loud noises on the audio so you can go back and edit later. And you're reading and reading and reading and you want it to sound really good. And I'm a pretty harsh critic, so I do repeat a few things. That process took forever. You know, sitting in there, you need silence, in your cupboard, getting it done. But the outcome was really, really good. I'd say if there's, you know, something produced by a top publisher right up here, I'd be maybe just below that in that middle tier, but definitely not rubbish. Like it sounds good. The difference is you book a studio with a publisher, it's 10 grand. You do it in your cupboard with uh, Audacity, it's 150 bucks, you know, so you can do it that way as well. Gotcha. Yeah. So where can we find your books, man? Mate, on the website. So olocadventures.com, Oloc Adventures, and that's what it's all about, One Life, One Chance. So go there, you'll see all the blogs, all the pictures from the past expeditions and my two books up there for sale as well, mate. If you order from the website, I can sign them for you. If you use the Amazon links and all the ebook links and Audible and that stuff, obviously not, but yeah, enjoy. I loved your first book, man. Like I read the shit out of that. That was awesome. That was when I had you on. Remember, that would have been three, no, four years ago now, I think. Long time ago, man. Yeah. Long time. I was coming through on the book tour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was it. Back in Sydney. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Back in the rat race. Oh yeah, the hustle. Oh, I don't miss that, man. I do not miss that. We're we're at Noosa now. It so, is prime. It's like I look out, I'm in my office now, and it's like I look out and it's just bushland. I've got my banana trees there, I've got all my stuff, and it's like <laughs> bush, and it's so nice and so peaceful. Mate, that is the best, bro. So good for your health, hey. 
A hundred percent, man. A hundred percent. But dude, thank you so much for coming on. Like this is really cool. But man, thank you very much for, for coming on. I really, really appreciate your time. Absolute pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me on. We got to do it again. Hell yeah, we do. We do. Thanks, man. Cheers, right. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you got something out of it and you want to learn more, click the link below or type in High Performance Conversations with James Can, and you'll be able to check out all the podcasts that we've done. We cover a stack of different topics, everything from getting your mojo back, overcoming anxiety, self-doubt, self-esteem, and learning from some of the industries and some of the world's top performers in both business and in health. Look forward to having you on there.